Behind the Brand takes an inside look at the people that are making things happen. From up and coming entrepreneurs to the big guys, we show you how they go about their business. Meet the innovators with the know-how and vision to succeed. Get Behind the Brand. I'm Brian Elliott, welcome to Behind the Brand. Today my guest is President and CEO of JD Power & Associates, a brand synonymous with tracking customer satisfaction quality and buyer behavior, Finbar O'Neill. Welcome, Finn. It's a pleasure. Our viewers are small business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, mm-hmm. marketers, and uh, probably a lot of people want to know, how did you get this job? Ah, uh, well, actually, I, I, I actually started uh, as a lawyer, so there's absolutely no qualification. I, but I, I led a couple of car companies, and the big focus there is satisfying customers. and. J.D. Power started out uh, surveying uh, car buyers and doing deep dives into how they feel. So um, that's how, why they approached me. So you're not a car guy, though, right? No, I, I, I'm definitely not a car guy, but I do believe in getting it right for the customers because word of mouth uh, advocacy is a, a big issue, and I learned that when I led Hyundai. So you got to work on that. Tell us more about uh, Hyundai, and there are some pretty important sort of defining moments and you were pretty instrumental in helping them out in a pretty critical time. Well, I have to say the answer to that is we, as a team, did it. But, uh, you know, Hyundai started out in the United States and people imputed Japanese quality, but that wasn't there. And so they lost their reputation and the trust in the brand. And so in the late 90s, we had to decide, how do we regain the trust? Because giving rebates is not going to do it. And we decided on what was then a 10-year uh, powertrain warranty was breakthrough and a five-year 60,000 mile bumper to bumper warranty and so we focused on that relentlessly and uh, it started to turn around the brand and people started to come into the dealerships and kick the tires and uh, I left Hyundai in September of 03 but uh, you can see that they've continued to grow since then. Yeah I mean really a pivotal point I think in their history don't you think? Well, it, it was, and, and you know, there was quite a bit of debate in 1998, because Hyundai had only sold 90,000 cars, 25,000 of which were sold to fleet, so the dealers were not selling very many cars, and Hyundai had to decide, uh, are we going to survive in the U.S.? We were looking over the precipice of oblivion, yep. I mean, basically, and uh, so it was put up or shut up. It was kind of a, a t- like a two-pronged battle, right? It was probably dealing with the dealership concerns and consumer concerns, right? That's right. Well, of course, the, the main issue was the consumer, and the consumer had lost trust. And, you know, we had put big rebates in the car business, they call that putting money in the trunk. Right. You know, when you have a 2,000 rebate on a car that's already cheap, you're actually denigrating the brand and augering in the brand more. Uh, the dealers, of course, uh, you know, they, they need people to come to the dealerships, and it was our job to drive the people there, and since they didn't have trust, they weren't coming, and there was nothing we could do, and so we had to really struggle. How do we regain the trust? So basically, you took the risk out of uh, buying buying a vehicle That's and right. turned we, it around? We, yeah. Uh, the, the warranty, essentially, is a statement of confidence in the quality of the product, and we initially weren't sure how long it would take. We felt pretty good, although there was a lot of internal debate. The financial guys would you know, have their conservative projections say, you're going to bankrupt the company. Yeah. Well, yeah, but we don't have a, a much of a choice here. And then there were other guys saying, you're not doing nearly enough here. But we decided on the 10-year warranty with the five-year bumper-to-bumper, and uh, you know, the rest is history. So you come in as the general counsel. You're the, you're the law guy, and yeah. you're giving uh, advice to uh, executives and uh-huh. you know, senior management. How did you pull that off? I mean, that's got to be... Well, you know, there, uh, to me, there are, there are two kinds of lawyers, right? There's the lawyer who'll tell you every reason why you can't do something. Uh, you know, but I'm a believer in solutions. Look, you can tell me that I can be sued in the morning for wrongful parenting. <laughs> but the reality is, I don't think so. And if I am sued, I think I'll win. So I'm willing to take risks, and I'm very interested in how business works and how you manage risk. Uh, you, business people, especially your viewers, manage risk every day. And so I got used to dealing with giving people advice based upon their real business problems. And so, you know, that and when they did look down the bench in 1998, in February of 98, uh, there wasn't a lot there except me, so. (laughs) Well, I think you sort of of earned that, didn't you? I mean, that was was a really important uh, moment for leadership and uh, you you, you provided that. uh, Peter Drucker actually said something about leadership and the key word in leadership is we, right? So, uh, I wasn't 
the guy who initially came up with a 10-year warranty. It was a team, and we looked at a lot of different options. And you gave them like about 100 different ideas, didn't you? I mean, Oh, yeah. It was everything from, you know, putting... I mean, we even tested, what if we gave away $5,000, you know, yeah. uh, to uh, what if we gave concierge service and everything in between. And, but in the end, see, you're, you're looking ahead, so you don't know what's going to work. So right. you have, at a certain point, it's gut check time, and you just simply have to make a decision. So what's advice that you'd give people who are struggling with the same fundamental problem with their brand, big or small? How do you, you know, overcome some of those challenges? Well, there, the, I think the first thing is, are you in a product-centric industry or are you in a service-centric industry? If you're in a product-centric industry, product is king, and it drives uh, about 53% of customer satisfaction. Uh, and we see that in cars all the way through appliances. If you're in a service-centric industry, though, all of the elements, uh, people, and uh, all the way through process. And the most important probably ultimately is the, the people. What are the people you have and do they, do they uh, exude the right culture? Right. Uh, so with Zappos, for example, Tony Shea focuses really on getting the right people. And in fact, he's paid people that don't fit to go away. Right, like over $2,000, right? Yeah, a couple of thousand dollars yeah. he's paid, yeah. So J.D. Powers started as an automotive uh, focused brand or company. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk to us about why it started in automotive and then how you've diversified. Well, it, it really started out, Dave Bauer actually, uh, out, of, uh, out of college, went to work for the Ford Motor Company. But in 1968, he took a gamble. He d gave up his day job because he thought if you could really ask consumers in depth how they feel about product, then, uh, you know, you could actually inform uh, the, the uh, competitors in that marketplace about how to d deal with the consumers. Uh, we started, Toyota was the first customer. Okay. And what year was that about? 1968, 40 years ago. Wow. Uh, Dave Power, and he started out around his kitchen table with his kids, taping quarters to surveys and mailing them out. You know, so you talk about a gamble on a business model. Yeah. That was Dave Power's gamble. Uh, was that before the BRC, the, you know, the, the customer feedback form, whatever they call that, you know? Oh, yeah, this, 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 this was low-tech days. Yeah. Uh, you say 53% of customer satisfaction is the product. What, what accounts for some it, of the other percentage? Certainly, uh, for example, just think about cars. You know, the, the customer's actual experience with the product day after day after day really informs a lot of their satisfaction. But, for example, uh, the, uh, the price and, and the packaging of the car. Uh, have an, you know, does it meet their needs? And then the process, really, especially after you buy, the whole process of service, and there's a l huge concentration in the automotive industry uh, around that. I mean, Lexus is king around that, but uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, all of the brands work very, very hard uh, so the customers uh, get it fixed right the first time, don't have to spend a ton of time waiting for the car, and they get it when, they're, when it's promised. A lot of people are talking about customer service as the new marketing. How do you feel about that? There's always some new marketing every few years, but the eternal verity has always been the customer and taking care of the customer's needs. And if you can consistently keep your eye on that, you might have to freshen the marketing from time to time. But uh, you don't want to play whack-a-mole, right. right? You want to keep at the core of your business, what does your customer need? And look at your business from the customer's eyes in. Right. We have a tendency in business to look from where we sit out. Right. So is that your main focus then? You know, you're, you started in automotive, now you're diversifying into other mm -hmm. products and industries. Still, though, is that the common thread through it all that you're... It's absolutely the same case. That's right. If you, whether it's retail banking, financial services, insurance, you know, you, you really have to, you know, I, I, we, we deal with a, a number of insurance companies, but USAA, for example, uh, they're very, very focused on when, when their members call in of trying to solve the problems with the one call not having people transferred all around and having to re-explain yourself right. and all of that. Uh, and, and that's why they're, they're, they have very high ratings from the customers, 98% renewal rate. So your, your focus maybe on, and your branding strategy is a lot about listening, isn't it? Yes. Well, you, you, uh, there, there are th you're really three ways of trying to understand. You can ask the customer, which is the old traditional way with a survey. You can watch them, which is kind of click stream or uh, uh, focus groups. Uh, Analytics. Yeah. Or you can listen to them, uh, which is social media, for sure. example. What are they saying about your brand out there? So that's interesting. You mentioned Tony Shea, who's at the forefront of using new media and social mm -hmm. media. What are you guys doing in that 
space? Well, we're, you know, first of all, we have a core, which is the traditional survey. Some of our surveys are still go out by mail. Uh, but we are, uh, we are, we've gone beyond that just putting the survey on the internet and we are looking at social media. We do click stream. In the automotive space, for example, we have a huge database about people who actually buy cars in the United States and we match them to the click stream activity of those places, uh, those people, so that we understand where they were in, uh, at various uh, uh, times in their shopping process on the internet so people can figure out where do you advertise on the internet. Yeah. Where do real buyers go? Not not kids and convicts, but real real buyers. So it's UI and UX customer mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, even though we started out uh, taping quarters, we were actually adapting to the new age. Excellent. Um, what business advice would you give to some of these new companies who have a logo? They've got a, a brand. How do you go from being good to great? How do you win the JD Power and Associates Award? That's what everyone wants to know, I think. We actually, this uh, past year, we, we looked at um, 20 industries and 800 brands and tried to figure out who were the customer service champions. And some of the companies that rose to the top, and they ranged from Lexus and Cadillac to uh, USAA uh, in, in the insurance space, was um, their focus on all of the drivers of customer satisfaction. Uh, very focused on people. Uh, the presentation, how you, how you actually market the product and how, how your stores look, that kind of thing. Uh, product and price, packaging, you really, ha what do the people expect? Uh, and, and, and then the process. But above all, I think the great brands have even a higher purpose. They're not just interested in market share and profit, they're interested and exude an interest in serving the customer. So does it mean like the greater good or there's a higher purpose? It is or? kind of like the top of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Self-actualization. Right. And I think uh, that's where Tony Shea comes in, right? He, he talks about uh, happiness. And yeah. of course, happiness sounds like a metaphysical thing. But it really is about exceeding what the customer expects and perhaps anticipating what they need but what they're not aware of. Yeah, I love Tony's book. And it is about customer satisfaction. It is about feeling good about your purchase. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I think Zappos does really well is allows you to return just about anything you want at any time, right? That's right. Is and that, no postage. That yeah. classic story of, you know, someone who bought shoes for, I think it was his or her mother who passed away and, um, you know, they still had the shoes around. And of course, they took them back. And there's a great story about caring about people. Well, the, 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 yeah. And, and to, when they, uh, one of the things they do, for example, for their customers, if they're out of stock, They'll actually, while you're online with them, they'll uh, they'll look up to see with competitors if the stock is available. Yeah. But the interesting thing about Tony, it's not just we'll do everything the customer says. I mean, he says also it's okay to fire a customer who's unreasonable. Right. But you should go for a customer who's being reasonable. You should go to the nth degree to try to take care of them. So that builds trust, right? Yeah. That, that builds trust, and you do it consistently. It also builds a workforce that takes pride in creating that trust, and it becomes sustaining. Let's explore that a little bit, a little bit more uh, with JD Power and Associates. So, how important is trust to you guys? You have you've become the it is critical, the source. It is critical to our brand, and and that's one of the things that when Dave Power started out in 1968, it wasn't that people didn't do surveys, but a lot of the surveys were done internally by companies, and so the Detroit. Uh, car companies at that time did surveys. In fact, when he went to Ford to try to sell the survey that said their customer satisfaction was bad, Ford told him, no, 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 our surveys say that our customers love us. Yeah, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's right. So at the core of the JD Power brand, and really Dave Power, was that independent look. And that's the thing we have to fiercely uh, protect. So we, we can't you know, if we're going to publish a result, we can't take sample from the from the industry. We got to go out and find independent sample right. and pull those people. Non biased so, and that's a challenge these days. You know, because of you know privacy laws and and whatnot. What is something about you, maybe uh, even something personal, you can share that a lot of people may not know about you? Uh, maybe it's your work style or your your philosophy. I believe very much in the we. I, I've always been a, a collaborative kind of guy, and uh, sometimes it's okay for other people to get credit. You know, my, my point of view, uh, for example, I, I ran a company, Reynolds & Reynolds, in Ohio. It's a public company, and we own 40% of the space for a computer systems to run automobile dealerships. And my theory was, if 10 of my salesmen make more than me as a CEO, I'm going to be a lot smarter. Right. And it would have been the case. So it's, that, that, you got to have 
you, you, if you want the people around, around you to succeed and you help them to succeed, you automatically succeed. So it, it does come back around to the people? Uh, it definitely does. Finn, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on all your success. Well, it's been a pleasure. Brian, thank you. Thanks.